Hello again. Welcome to another YouTube video in period 7, 1890 to 1945. This is our third of the uh, videos. We did one on foreign policy, progressivism, and now we're doing World War I and the New World Order. And uh, I'm going to try and go through this a little quicker perhaps than I did the other two. Uh, again, you will have uh, PowerPoint notes on Edmodo, so you can follow along using those. And uh, there will be a lot more I'll discuss in class, especially with Woodrow Wilson's war message, uh, and get us talking about some of these things here in the PowerPoint there. So we're predominantly going to be in 7.3, although at one point I am going to pull us into 7.2, so be prepared for that. The uh, United States has been participating in global conflicts. Well, it's starting with the Spanish-American War, just a little more than two decades or so before World War I. Uh, America is still, though, on the fence about what, they, what their role should be. Uh, here in 7.3, Roman numeral II, it tells you uh, World War II and its aftermath will continue the debates this ongoing debate will continue about should America play a bigger role in the world or should it continue to pursue its own self-interest. Think Washington's farewell address, this idea of neutrality. When the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, he's shot while he's on a goodwill tour in Sarajevo. Um, the Black Hand organization. Uh, they're wanting Serbian uh, independence. And basically, it's a teenager that shoots him. That's why I'm sort of afraid of you guys. But uh, yeah, that's a side note. But this starts a whole series of things in Europe. They had all those alliances that Washington, and my cursor here, told us to stay away from. And nationalism, militarism, all these things are growing in Europe, uh, and it is in this alliance system. It has led to this moment that, for whatever reason, European powers weren't really prepared for it. They thought a war that maybe lasts a few months to a year, and it turned into a horrible, horrible nightmare, and it was mostly because technology had changed on them. The United States is conflicted. The United States wants to stay neutral. There it is in our key concept. Um, they're, but departing from U.S. foreign policy, their tradition of non-involvement, that is something they don't want to do. In the beginning, it says that uh, in a response to Woodrow Wilson's call for the defense of humanitarian and democratic principles, he will finally get involved because not of some of the things that maybe you think of. It's not like America has allies. They're going to go help allies. Uh, yes, the Germans may have sent a note to the Mexicans, known as the Zimmerman note, offering Mexico the chance to gain back territory they lost in the Mexican-American War if they allied themselves to the United States. That didn't actually draw us into the war. What happens is the Germans start to launch unrestricted submarine warfare. Even though Wilson has asked them to please stop, they respond by increasing their attacks on any ship in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's this submarine warfare that takes place that Wilson thinks is just barbaric. He finally decides on April 6, 1917 to ask for a declaration of war. At this point in time, this is America's, let's see, one, two, three, our fourth declaration of war. Remember the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, and the last one we talked about was the Spanish-American War. Now the United States asked for, or Wilson asked for the declaration of war on Germany. And it's interesting, and we're going to look at this very specifically in class. The reason becomes this humanitarian democratic principle. Remember, Wilson, a Democrat, a, an embracer of progressivism, uh, this liberal thought in America, he wants to lecture now the world on what democracy is. So he states in his farewell address, or his farewell address, his war message, to make the world safe for democracy. But whose democracy? Well, in all honesty, it's the United States form of democracy. And those nations in Europe basically practice, you know, monarchies. 
And he's going to try and see if he can bring about this progressive agenda, this idea of American democracy to Europe, because he feels like that's what's caused all this problem. America's goal now for war is changed. America's not seeking territory. They're not seeking conquest. America is supposedly now more idealistic with the idea of making the world safe for all people, but for democracy. In letter B, it tells you that, well, again, this is why we don't talk a lot about World War I in, world, in American history. It's more of a world history course because relatively limited role in combat. There's not a lot of battles and things like that the United States fights in. What actually helps, what America's contribution is more the fact that they have a sheer volume of numbers of bodies they could put into action if they wanted to. We're talking well over 10 to 15 million men if they needed to. The German army is depleted. We're now years into the war. The war began in 1914. The United States does not declare war until 1917, uh, which is three years later. And they don't send the first round of troops until the beginning of 1918. So the German nation is falling apart. And it's the fear of how many bodies the United States can put in there that really helps to end the war more than anything else. But again, we talk about how do you make the world safe for democracy? Well, on January 8th, 18, 1918, Wilson gives his famous 14-point speech. He's got 14 ways to make the world safe for democracy. Now, I'm never going to cover all 14 with you, but look at these four or five and see how exactly would you, if I was to ask you, how do these things help promote democracy? No more secret treaties, freedom of the seas, take away, take away any economic barrier like all the tariffs, a reduction of arms, no more weapons, stop building weapons, and this idea of colonial claims has got to stop. It's a beautiful sentiment. The last point, 14, is this idea of a combined national uh, a group of nations that come together, the League of Nations. Uh, you know, it's Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. I always get that confused. Oh, my goodness, I did that again. No, that's the Justice League. Okay, this is the League of Nations. This is all of the countries that are going to come together and form a diplomatic body and a diplomatic solution to whenever there's aggression, thereby avoiding war ever again. And you know this is a success. Well, actually, no. We do call this now World War I for a reason. This isn't going to work because, as you're going to come to find out, the United States never joins the League of Nations. Yes, for those of you hearing this for the first time, it is President Woodrow Wilson of the United States of America who comes up with the League of Nations, but our Congress, and we're going to talk about this, will refuse to join it. And when he goes to Europe to bring his 14 points, Europe is going to reject these 14 points, except for this last one, the League of Nations. Yeah. And again, this is, this is going to torment Wilson to the point it's going to make him very sick. Now, I bring in 7-2 in here. This is key concept 7-2 now. Um, and I only give this first part of letter C because it says official restrictions on freedom of speech grew during World War I. The United States, even though they fight very little in here, decided that they could not allow Americans to speak out against their government. You get Espionage and Sedition Acts. Uh, espionage is when you actually commit acts of terror or destroying and stopping physically things of the government. Spying is also part of espionage. And sedition is where you speak out against the government. You may remember a sedition act. Here's a nice review for you. John Adams, second president of the United States, were at a pseudo war with the French. He passes an alien or immigration act and a sedition act. You can't speak out against the government. Only this one is going to be heavily enforced. You have a situation where the Socialist Party in America began to speak out against this. Remember our good friend Eugene Debs? Hey, he goes to jail now for the third time. And it's up to other leaders to try to carry on this torch. And a Charles uh, Shank, uh, Shank versus the United States of America, 
he'll begin to put into the mail these various flyers saying you cannot allow young men to be drafted. He says that's a violation, and here's a copy of it, of the 13th Amendment, which is to end slavery. So he starts mailing this out. Because he's using United States mail, this is considered sedition and perhaps even espionage. He is arrested and he's put in jail. He goes to court suing for his First Amendment, his right of speech, his freedom of speech, protection from the government. But the, gov but the Supreme Court rules against him. This is a very important case. This expression, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, Judge Oliver Holmes will say this. He's not the chief justice, but he's the one that, that expresses this. You can't allow people to say whatever it is they want to say if, in fact, it can cause horrible damage or danger or death to individuals. And they felt during war, trying to tell people not to participate in a draft is a problem. They call it the clear and present danger test. If you say something or you do something that the United States government to this day decides is a clear and present danger to the United States or the people of the United States, you're going to jail. You're not passing go. You're not collecting $200. You're going to jail. Here, So we have Shank versus the United States, 1919. And again, I'm going to try and bring this up in class again and go a little bit more in depth with this, especially how this relates to the suffrage movement that was taking place at the same time. So let's get back to 7.3. Here we are now in letter C. Here, Wilson becomes our first sitting president to go to Europe. This was actually quite uh, an astonishing thing. The Republican Party denounced this, of course, and then the Democratic Party cheered it. His, To me... His big mistake in this is that when he goes to Europe and he brings a delegation of American members of government, he does not include any Republicans. He decides it's all going to be Democrats. So he alienates the Republican Party, which by now has, control, now has gained control of the Senate. So they're going to fight him on this. And when he gets to Europe to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, to try to get the United States to join the League of Nations, it's all going to fall apart on him. And this is the big four, by the way. I have them here. Wilson of the United States, Prime Minister Orlando of Italy, uh, Prime Minister Lloyd George of Great Britain, and Clemenceau of France. He doesn't get along with any of these men. There's a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of arguing, something that this man, Woodrow Wilson, has never done in his life. He's not a yeller or screamer. He's, he, remember, he's our only president with a college degree, a PhD. This isn't him. And it makes him sick. Okay, it makes him sick. When he gets back to the United States, now he's got to face the Republican Party. The Republican leader is Henry Cabot Lodge. They look at this treaty, and there's several articles. Article 1, Article 2, Article, it's not Article X, that's a Roman numeral, that's Article 10. If you sign the Treaty of Versailles, you automatically are a member of the League of Nations. And Article 10 tells us that if one country in the League is attacked by a non-member of the League, automatically every nation in the League goes to war. Congress do not like this, the Republican Party specifically, because Congress gives war-making powers to Congress. <laughs> okay, the, the Constitution gives war-making powers to Congress. They weren't going to give up those war-making powers, and quite frankly, this is only my opinion here. This isn't Truth or fact, don't tell me it's fake news. It's just my opinion. I'm just telling you. I think that's actually probably a good thing. They, they should have compromised on this. Why allow the rest of the world to dictate when people go to war? Let each country decide for itself. Um, the Republicans, what's called filibuster, or delay the ratification long enough for it not to win a vote in Congress. Wilson is so angry now. He's been angry with these men yelling and screaming now he's angry with Henry Cabot Lodge. He goes on a tour of the country, city after city, state after state, trying to get rile up support for Americans to, to say to your congressman to vote for this. On September 25th, 1919, in Pueblo, Colorado, while standing on stage giving a speech, he begins to stumble his words, he begins to lose his footing, and he almost falls down. They have to get him. What we'll find out later on is he begins to suffer a series of strokes. What a lot of people did not know 
was that many years earlier he had already had strokes. He was a very private man. And I'm going to talk about this in class. I hope I remember to do this. But we have this moment for the last 18 months of Wilson's presidency. When the president isn't able to perform, normally the vice president takes over. But in 1919, it's kind of vague about that. So Woodrow Wilson's wife, Edith Wilson, basically pretended to be the president for 18 months. And I have another one of those great articles to show you guys uh, about how that took place, how she basically took over the government for about 18 months, and how she fooled the United States and the United States Senate, making people believe that he was better off than what he really was. So all that idealism that Wilson had, all his progressive ideas, do not come to fruition. The United States does not join the League. The United States does not ratify the Treaty of Versailles. And our last concept, well, no, I'm sorry, D and E. D tells us now what happens. In 1920s, the Republican Party gains the White House again. We're going to talk about these two men later on. You have um, Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge. Republican leadership, and then ends with Herbert Hoover, three Republican presidents in a row. Under Republican rule, we go back to isolationism. The United States does not want to get involved. They decide they wind up signing a separate treaty with the Germans, so they're not part of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations. Also, while Warren G. Harding is president, they hold the Washington Naval Conference, Sometimes known as the Five Powers Act, and later on it was the Nine Powers Act, because all these nations begin to sign it. First time in human history, a treaty for disarmament. In other words, we'll stop making certain weapons. And in this case, it was battleships. It was battleships. The bigger countries had a bigger ratio. They can, say, build uh, five battleships a year, where smaller countries can only do like one. A loophole to this was a new type of ship that they didn't know yet was going to come on the horizon known as aircraft carriers. No restrictions on those. Oh, that might be a problem. You know, we have World War II right around the corner. You have the Dawes plan that happens while Calvin Coolidge is president. Germany has runaway inflation. I mean, literally, it's trillions of dirt marks for one American dollar. It, the inflation gets ridiculous. They owe billions of dollars to the French and the English to repay them for war debts. And the French and the English owe Americans billions of dollars. Okay, this is the dumbest thing ever. Just listen to me. Let's say, for sake of argument, to make it simple, caterus paribus, all things equal, the United States will give $10 billion to Germany. Germany will then take $5 billion and pay off their debts to the French and $5 billion to pay off their debts to the English. Then the English will give America back $5 billion that it owes America and France will give back $5 billion what it owes to America. That doesn't make any sense, I know. It's sort of like I borrowed $10 from Fred and Fred borrowed $10 from Mark and I gave and Mark borrowed ten dollars from me. I gave friend ten, Fred my ten dollars. He turned around, and gave it to Mark, and Mark gave it right back to me. And all our debts are settled. That's what the Dolls Plan is. You might want to play this about a thousand times before you figure out what it is. I would also absolutely recommend reading it in the textbook. Kellogg Briand Pact again during Calvin Coolidge presidentship. Sixty-two nations get together. They sign a non-aggression pact. Never again to fight war ever again. And there's no way to enforce that. Within a few months, several of the countries are at war. By the time Germany invades Poland in 1939, only one nation was still holding on to this kellogg briand Pact, and that was the United States. So again, these the America is trying its best to stay isolated and stay out of world affairs. And how does this work out for us? Well, yes. We get... Chaps like this come on the rise. Fascism, with no one to stop it. Unbridled fascism throughout Europe and militarism in Japan. The United States will sign, or the United States Congress creates a series of neutrality acts. 1935, 36, and 37, and then again another one in 1939. Uh, they will not allow the president 
Now it's going to be FDR to get involved in European affairs. You have the Spanish Civil War is taking place. Can't give them money. Can't give them guns. You can't send troops. Then later on, when all of Europe goes to war in 39 with, with the Nazis, Congress won't allow, the, again, FDR to help. If someone needs help, you have to do what's called a cash carry basis. Say Great Britain needs weapons. They'll have to come with absolute either gold or cash, buy it directly, and then cash carry. Bring it on their ships back to England. Cash carry will work a little bit until, of course, Great Britain basically goes bankrupt because, you know, they're the last nation fighting the Nazis. And then they're going to have to get rid of that. It's going to be the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which we'll talk about at another time, finally brings America into this war. Well, I hope this was a little bit quicker than the other ones I did. Like I said, we'll do a little bit more in class. All right. Talk to everybody later. See ya.